I think it's important that we try to hold two seemingly competing ideas in our heads. That on one hand, education, and especially higher education, is a ticket to a great job and a great life. I'm going to share data from around the globe later to demonstrate that this is as true as it's ever been. But on the other hand, to also appreciate that it may be broken in certain respects, that it may not be worth the cost in certain respects. And I think both of these are true, that education is both a ticket to a great job and a great life, and especially as we look at the lens of higher education, there are indeed, on many levels that we've measured it, broken linkages between the graduates who are leaving these institutions and their readiness for success, particularly in the workplace. I'm going to share data from several studies that we've done in the United States on college in general and college graduates, the largest representative study of college graduates that's been done in the U.S. And then I'm going to share data from Gallup's World Poll. Many people know Gallup because of our polling in the United States. We also conduct the World Poll, which is statistically sampling 99% of the world's population over the age of 15 every single year. There's only two countries right now where we do not have representative sampling frames. So the first thing I want to share are three separate studies we did in the U.S. that I think get at this skills gap and disconnect in very powerful ways. When we survey chief academic officers of colleges and universities in the United States, 96% are somewhat or extremely confident that they're preparing students for success in the workplace. But when we interview a representative sample of Americans, they have a very different report card. And that is that only 14% strongly agree college graduates are well prepared for success in the workplace. And when we ask C-level business executives in the United States, it's even worse. Only 11% strongly agree that graduates have the skills needed for the jobs they're trying to fill. When you ask people what they want out of higher education, it's a very clear answer today. And it might have been in the past as well, but this one is certainly clear in the United States, whether you ask current college students, parents of fifth through 12th graders who may soon be sending their children to college, or the American population as a whole, the number one reason why people value higher education is to get a good job. And indeed, those results are reflected in the WISE Gallup survey that we conducted and that many of you in this audience participated in. 69% of the WISE population here at this conference who participated in that survey agree that it's the job of a university to prepare students for success in the workplace. So here's an important question. Of the graduates who become successful, who become employed, and who are also not just employed, but engaged in their work, what were the ingredients of the college or university experience that is linked to that success later in life? And what we found is that there are six elements that we've learned in our study either emotionally supported, and I'll describe those in a minute, or hit the mark on certain experiential learning opportunities, that if you strongly agreed to these statements as a graduate, it doubles the odds that you're engaged in your work later in life, whatever that work is. So what are these things? First, it's you strongly agree that you had at least one professor who made you excited about learning. That's a pretty low bar considering that you're talking about four or five or six years of an educational experience. That you strongly agree the professors at your alma mater cared about you as a person. And that you strongly agreed that you had a mentor who encouraged your goals and dreams. Here's the problem. The percentage of college graduates in the United States who have hit the mark on these is appallingly low. As you can see, only two out of ten strongly agree they had a mentor who encouraged their goals and dreams. Collectively, those who strongly agree to all three of these things, it's just 14% of all of our graduates in the United States. Now, we also found three experiential elements that if graduates hit the mark on, they also doubled the odds of being engaged in work later in their life. And they are whether they worked on a long-term project that took a semester or more to complete, connected to a lot of the discussions we're having about project-based learning, etc whether they had a job or an internship where they applied what they were learning in the classroom. This is so important, it was a sorting question because we also asked, did you have a paid job, yes or no? That didn't sort. What did was whether you felt that work experience was curated and connected in some way to the things you were learning in the classroom. 
And finally, that you were extremely involved in some sort of extracurricular activity, which was also a sorting question because we asked a long list of things that a student or graduate could have been involved in. Here's the point. Collectively, less than a third of all college graduates in the United States have hit the mark on any of these. And those who strongly agree to all three, it's a mere 6%. We certainly have a lot of room for improvement on the qualitative experiences of college. Interestingly enough, on the job and internship one, 80% um, of wise respondents in our wise Gallup survey say they would hire a B minus student with an internship over a student with an A plus. Eight out of 10 would take the B minus student with an internship over an A plus student without one. Now I'm gonna switch and share with you results from the Gallup World Poll. These are the first peak at data related to education from our World Poll, so I'm excited to release them here at the WISE Summit. This is data covering first 160 countries, and I'm gonna show you the definitive case at a global level of the value of more education. So first, those who are better educated, and you can see this by years of education, zero to eight, nine to 15, 16 plus, the percentage that are employed 30 hours or more and receive a regular paycheck from an employer, what Gallup would call having a good job, is just night and day differences between those with more education compared to less. This is true all over the globe, and you can see some of the breaks by region, consistent, although slight differences, true everywhere. We also know that the more educated you are, the higher you rate and evaluate your life, the better your well-being is in an overall perspective of how you experience your life. So as you can see here, again, the more education, the higher the life rating and evaluation, and this is true all over the globe. It's especially true when you look at transitional economies, where you can see differences here that are in some ways even more pronounced on life evaluation between those who are more educated and those who are less educated. So this matters not just in developed countries, but in developing nations. Now I'm gonna to segue to three questions that we added this past year as pilot questions. This is data that I only have from 68 countries where we're able to pull the data in time for the conference. So this is a smaller sample of countries on the following three questions. Are you satisfied or dissatisfied with the educational opportunities in your country? Do you think teachers in this country are well respected? And are you satisfied or dissatisfied with the schools in the area that you live? So first, this is not surprising, satisfaction with educational opportunities is highly strongly correlated with GDP. It's also the case that although these are not the only ways we should measure students in schools, that for example, satisfaction with educational opportunities at a country level is strongly correlated with PISA math scores, PISA reading scores, and PISA science scores. What we've also learned is that there's an interesting difference between satisfaction with local schools and satisfaction with the broader question of educational opportunities, where globally we actually see a bit of a gap in satisfaction, where people are actually less satisfied overall with the educational opportunities that are available to them, although there are a couple regions where there are some differences. Here's a couple interesting data points that we've dug up. Younger people, if you break this by age, are more dissatisfied with schools in their area than older people. Some of this makes some sense, but keep in mind these are the ones who are either currently experiencing their school or have just experienced their school and they're the most likely to be dissatisfied. In a similar vein, we also found that parents who have more children are more likely to be dissatisfied with schools locally. So between zero children, one, two, or more, dissatisfaction with schools locally goes up. And then finally, one of the questions I was most interested in is the degree to which people feel that teachers are well respected in their country. One of the first stunning things that we found is that there are huge differences across the globe in this. So what I'm showing you here are the top 10 countries on respect for teachers and the bottom 10. And you certainly will see that there are probably some cultural norms that are connected to this because it's true that respect for teaching strongly correlates with respect for women and children in these countries. But look at the differences in respect for teachers when you look at a country like Sweden where only 31% of the people there feel that teachers are well respected, compared to 95% in a country like Uzbekistan. 
Now, certainly if you think about the future and the opportunity to get a talented teaching corps into schools, it is certainly a terrifying idea to think about a culture that does not respect teaching. And I would submit that there's only three skills that are going to be needed in the future. How to teach, how to learn, and how to work hard. And if we don't respect the profession of teaching globally or at a country level, the entire thing unravels.